Welcome to my podcast, All Things Agriculture. I'm your host, Eric Carey, and thank you for tuning in. On this podcast, get to know those who work in agriculture on a daily basis. Find out what they do, the challenges and opportunities they face, and what they think the future holds for agriculture. You'll also have a chance to hear what they do for fun when they aren't working hard to feed the world. If you're watching on YouTube, please consider subscribing to my channel and leaving a thumbs up and a comment below. If you prefer the audio version, you can listen for free on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. And if you'd like to get into contact with me, please email me at allthingsagr at gmail.com. Thank you and enjoy the episode. Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to All Things Agriculture Podcast. I'm Eric Carey, and today I am joined by Chad Branton, who is a good friend of mine from college and has a farm in western New York, and they use all no-till practices for planting crops. Yeah, for the most part. We do some uh, strip-till and a few things like that, a few variations, but no uh, full-width tillage. Okay, so yeah, why don't you elaborate, like, you know, where you're from and every, you know, how big's your farm? and So I'm from uh, Stafford, New York, which is pretty much halfway between Rochester and Buffalo. Um, we farm about 1,600 acres now and do a fair amount of custom work. Um, everything's all either no-till, planted with a drill, no-till planted with a corn planter, or uh, we strip-till with either a Krauss Gladiator or a Great Plains Nutri-Pro, and that's about the extent of our tillage. Um, we do quite a bit of cover cropping and uh, actually try to be 100% cover crop by the end of the year and do, I think, eight different crops. We do corn, sweet corn, peas, rye, oats, um, soybeans, and we do grow some hay as well. So quite a diverse operation and custom combining and custom drilling all over western New York. And it's, uh, I guess, uh, for those who don't know what n- the practice of no-tilling is, is I guess elaborate on what exactly you mean by that, like no-till versus tillage. and Okay. Um, in no-till, we don't use a plow of any kind. We don't use a disc or disturb the soil surface very much. The only thing that'll disturb it in true no-till is the the planter row unit opener or the drill opener. Um, and in strip till, it works a very small area, just wide enough to plant the seed in for the row unit on the corn planter or the, the soybean planter. And it's less invasive than full width tillage, which is tilling every inch of the soil. And, and you sent me a bunch of pictures. So late, you know, if, if people don't still don't quite know what we're talking about, the pictures will help paint a picture um, in your head of what it looks like. I guess if you aren't listening or if you aren't watching on YouTube, it might be hard to see the pictures, but you'll have to watch it. So I'll try to explain everything as best as I can. Yeah. But uh, so I guess more on your farm, it's uh, you and your father, correct? Yeah. My father and I are the, I guess you'd say the, the managers and the, the partners and my brother-in-law helps us out on the farm. He's our, our only employee, so to speak. My mom does the book work in the office for the most part. Me and my father help sometimes. And, uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Just uh, a family, you know, just, and it's been, are you third generation or did your father start the farm? So my dad's dad had a dairy farm back in the sixties and he fell off a barn roof and died. And they ended up selling the cows, so that was the end of my father's dairy farming. Um, They had a herd of about 65 Guernseys at the time. And in 1979, he started his own farm with borrowed equipment, and eventually he gained, gained enough land to build up his own equipment line and started being able to buy land, and he worked either part-time jobs or full-time jobs for the first, I would say, 10 to 15 years of his farming career because the farm couldn't sustain enough income for him to to raise a family on. 
So after that, he be he was able to full time farm, and it evolved eventually into what we are today. And yeah, so it's been is the farm that she, the farm that was a dairy is where you guys began. Then is that origin? Is that still? like ground that you work where the dairy was originally? Actually, where the dairy was originally, my grandmother had the neighbors work after my grandpa passed away. And it wasn't until, I think it was 2010, 2012, somewhere in that, that we actually started working that land again. But then we did end up buying it. Um, I believe it was two years ago now. So we do own it and we're still working it. So it was a lot of years where you didn't even work the land that your grandfather had. Yeah, that was that's that kind of weird. That was kind of odd to me growing <laughs> up. That it was like my dad's a farmer and the neighbors work my grandmother's land, but dad said they did her a favor and started working it and renting it from her after he fell off the roof. And she always felt to be true to them, to let them keep working it. Yeah. Huh. That's, I don't think that happens very often, you know, no. just in terms of the, the war of land and farming that people aren't yeah. familiar with. It's, uh, it, you know, it, people are always looking for land and it can, it's hard to oh, yeah, do have, stuff on a handshake anymore. There's some quite large operations in our area and we found that it's key to maintain neighborly relations with people because, uh, I mean, we have a large vegetable grower near us, Tory Farms, and they could buy any given piece of land right around where we work, but because we have such a good relationship with them that we don't really compete for land with them. Yeah. You, you don't step on their toes. They don't step on exactly. yours. You help each other out. That's, yes. that's yeah. It's like you said, it's, it's good to get along with your neighbors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a, I'd say that's one of the most important things in farming. Yeah. No, you're, it, it's true. It's very true. And, uh, but so how large is your, is your farm? We work in total about 1,600 acres. I think we own roughly half of that. And, and the rest is rented from landowners of various kinds. I mean, there's people who own as little as, I'd say, 30 acres, then other people that own 200 acres. And your land's, I, you've showed me maps, your land's kind of spread out over, a, a not a huge distance, but... A, I, I would say a 10 to 15 mi- 15 mile radius would cover everything, but a 10 mile radius covers most everything. So not, not very bad. Yeah. So I guess getting more into the uh, your no-till practice, how did your dad get into doing that type of... Well, he tells stories about back when he... Uh, was I think it was in the late 80s he started reading about people no tilling and doing less tillage so he had a I forget if it was a 12 row or 6 row John Deere planter and he said in the back corner of a field he didn't till a spot just to see if it works and he planted that where nobody could see what he was doing because he didn't want people being like what are you doing that for and he said it it worked and it yielded I can't remember if he said almost as well or just as well as all the corn in the rest of the field. So eventually he started playing more and more with that. And in, I think it was uh, 1996, he bought a 12-row Kinsey planter with zone till coulters on it, which were just three straight blades in front of the row unit to loosen the ground a little. And that's when he started really going after not tilling and finding alternatives. And then in 99, he bought a true no-till drill. It was a flexi-coil air seeder. And that's when he started not tilling for any of the peas or the the wheat or anything he planted with a drill. And what kind of benefits has he seen over the decades of u- using no-till? Um, we see very little erosion. I can remember, even in my lifetime, we'd have to get the chisel plow out or the disc and go fix washouts in certain fields. And that's pretty much a thing of the past. Um, water infiltration, when we get a heavy rain event, you can see on the neighbor's land, you'll see a lot of standing water. And on our own, there's almost no standing water. Um, I mean, it, you drive past a creek in our area after it's rained quite a bit and it's just brown. And you know it's dirt washing off of fields. And you look at our tile lines in that that are running quite a bit of the time, and they're crystal clear water. 
Um, we've also seen better soil health, which leads to better yields, um, more adaptable soil, so to speak. So it'll take different, <clears throat> different types of weather events and still produce a good crop. So it can be a dry year and you'll still see an okay crop, or it can be a really wet year and the soil structure just helps to let the crop grow better under all circumstances. Yeah, I think that's a big thing. It's a whole soil structure, the environment, the microbiology, all that within the soil is really, it's extremely, I think we've always known about it, but we've never, um, no-till has really opened the eyes of how important it is and how, like you said, you can, having that organic matter on that topsoil that retains a lot of water. And if you aren't breaking that down every year by plowing it under, you're holding it, you're just building it and building it. That's just water retention and keeping a nice surface. And it's, yeah, it's beneficial. Makes every job a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. And it's faster. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my dad would say he's out there planting at two miles an hour with his zone till planter back in the day. And he was like, what am I doing this for? Everybody's planting it five or six miles an hour around me, covering twice the acres. And then he thought about it. I'm one guy covering 75 acres a day with one unit. You couldn't do that with one guy on another operation where you had to till everything up before you planted. Yeah, till it, let it dry, and then till it again to smooth it up and then plant. Yeah. It's, yeah. And then it's hope it doesn't downpour. Yeah, and fuel. And it's... Yeah. it's um. Yeah, it's I've I've learned a lot from the years of knowing you now, and we didn't do any sort of we do a little bit of no till, and before I met you, we didn't do any no till, and we've kind of my dad's read up a lot on it, talking to you, and we've seen just benefits from it big time, and I think do you think there's a yield drag maybe that first year? Yeah, the first year to five years, depending on your soil, there could be a yield drag. Which basically, we're you're gonna see less you results of your crops compared to if you continue to till the ground. Yes, because the the soil structure hasn't hasn't transformed yet. Um, it still needs to be broken up physically versus the roots being able to do it. Um, I think cover crops help a lot with that transition period. If you're already using those on your farm, or if you start using those when you start no tilling that will help lessen the yield drag. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about cover crops, you know, what you do, wh- why do you do them? What are they good for? Um, you, I know you do a lot, a lot more than we do in terms of species. And so, yeah. That'd be... Yeah. I, I like to think we're at the forefront of cover cropping. Um, so a cover crop is a one species up to as many species as you can find that will work planted after your cash crop which is harvested and sold Um, and this crop is purely planted with the intention of being left in the field after it's either been terminated by a herbicide tillage or if it's a non-overwintering species it'll die off in the winter you leave all that residue on the field um, to be eaten by the microbes and the worms and turned into uh, what will eventually be organic matter in the field. Um, we use quite a few different species, but the biggest one we use is rye because you can plant that pretty much any time in the fall. I've planted as late as January the following year, and it's worked. Yeah, and being winter hardy, it'll survive it'll, the yes. winter, and it'll be there that spring. Yep, it'll it'll be the first thing to start growing in the spring. Um, it's got a great root system. It interacts with the soil microbes. Just a whole bunch of good things come out of it. So what's you were talking about multi species, so what's the what's the gain of doing a multi species uh, cover crop? So each species has a different impact on the soil. Um, there's ones like the tillage radish that have a deep tap root that'll break up compaction. Um, but it doesn't actually those ones don't interact with the soil microbes, the brassicas. But then there's ones like buckwheat that are great for surface compaction and making your soil a lot more um, it's, like it loose, loosens almost, it yeah, on, loose, the, on the yeah. top. And then the grasses have a nice root system that's fibrous, um, 
but then you have clovers that produce nitrogen and then they they all play a different part so to speak so it kind of covers all your bases and I know you've told me in the past that if you have a, a field that has wet spots or you know you'll find that certain species thrive in different conditions yeah yeah I mean I've planted up over 21 species in the same mix and it's amazing in certain parts of the field one species will thrive like there's areas that hairy vetch will look great in the spring and then there's other areas that the clovers will look good in the spring um so having all those different species in you're pretty much guaranteed that in one part of the field something is going to grow very well and for the most part in most parts of the field everything's going to grow and do what it's supposed to and the the conditions in the soil will just be unbelievable the next year. Yeah, and um, I know from a dairy standpoint, a great benefit that we found from cover crops is being able to have that forage in the spring to take off and, you know, with typically rye triticale for us and being able to use that as feed for the cows, so almost being able to double crop, take, a, take that cover crop off in the spring in early spring and then being able to take corn off or if someone's planting beans, whatever. So it's, and, um, yeah, that's a big benefit. I see more and more dairies are doing that in this area. So. Yeah. It's, uh, actually very beneficial. I mean, it's, you're getting the benefits of the root system in the ground and then you get a feed crop on top of that. Yeah. So if you drive around, um, any, you know, especially, you know, central New York, western New York, and you see a, a cornfield where it's just corn stubble, and if you see a green, you know, a green plant up, it's typically rye, triticale, or possibly um, another uh, cover crop that Chad was talking about. Yeah. No, it's a, it's getting to be a more common practice, especially on dairies, because the corn silage comes off so early that the people will be out chasing their chopper with a no-till drill or a vertical till tool and a spreader of some kind, which I think is great. I mean, yeah. the more green fields we have going into the winter, the better. Yeah, yeah that's exactly what we do. <laughs> so do you do you struggle getting cover crops on then when you're taking grain corn off? Because it can get late in the year. It is more of a challenge. Um, back when it was just my dad and I, before I had kids actually, I would oftentimes, I usually run the combine and I would combine till about eight o'clock at night and then I would hop in the tractor and drill and drill till about 11 or midnight. Um, but now since my brother-in-law works for us, he actually ran the drill most of this year. So dad and I would pick away at the harvesting and he would be covering the fields as fast as we could get them off. That's sped it up a lot. Yes. But <laughs> if it's a very wet year, then it's a real challenge. But even then we found that we have a airflow spreader which uses air instead of spinners to evenly distribute stuff. Like we use it for fertilizer or you can, we put rye in it and we'll just go blow it on top of the ground and you will have a somewhat decent stand the following year, even in corn stubble from the combine, which is quite thick or soybean residue. It works great on. So any type of seed dispersal is better than nothing, but ideally you'd be planting everything with the drill following the combine. Do you have, is there a picture of one of those? Do you um, have a picture? Yeah, the, the drill should be in there. Here, we'll, we'll pull up some pictures, everyone. Like I said, if you aren't watching on YouTube, you won't be able to see the pictures, but, um, so. Got to get the right folder up. Here we go. Which one is it? That guy? Yep. So what are we looking at, Chad? That is our uh, our drill, our no-till drill. It's a uh, 40-foot Great Plains, um, and the tractor we pull it with, we actually put triples on to help pull that big drill better and to lessen compaction, and just it helps the tractor a lot. Um, and if you can see that red box on the back, so the curve right here. Yes. I might have another picture in there of the, the back of the drill, which might show it better. So. 
Was that eight bit? No. That got eight bit. So that that red box I mounted on there so we could put dry fertilizer down with our small grains or our uh, alfalfa seedings and stuff like that. And I also use that to do what we call bio strip till after our small grains, which is where you plant um, live species in between where you're following your crop will grow. Well, overwintering species, I should say. And then where the actual row crop will be planted is non overwintering species. So that when you go to plant, you're not planting through a big thick mat of green material but in between the rows will still be a nice green cover crop, which will help to smother the weeds out. Yeah, you'll basically be planting into a dying or dead. It'll just be a... Yeah. It, yeah. It, there's there's pictures of that in there, too. Okay, let's see. This particular drill has... Uh, oh, this is you plant in? Yeah, this is planting this year's rye crop into a cover crop following field peas of uh, buckwheat, sunflower... Um, I had part of a bag of sweet corn that I threw in there and uh, tillage radish. And that stuff, it might not look that big from the picture, but it was actually about up to my belly button. And I'm about six foot three, so that's three and a half, four feet tall. And you wouldn't think you'd be able to plant through it, but it planted great. And that's probably our best looking field of rye. Yeah, what's it like pulling through? I mean, it's all on GPS. So you aren't having to steer and try to figure out where you're going. Yeah. You can't, you, I mean, you don't see the soil the whole time you're planting that field. So you have to get out and go back and make sure the seed placement's where you want it. But I mean, the tractor, it's like driving on a sponge, essentially, is what it feels like. It's firm, but it's soft. So you're not sinking in, but I had to set the depth a little bit deeper in order to cut through all that green residue. And it made the tractor pull harder because it was like driving on top of snow. You had a layer of that green residue that was just chewing underneath the tires. and But the, the seed bed was unbelievable. The soil tilth was amazing. So you don't have any issues with emergence or anything with all this, this growth? Or how do, you, how do you get rid of this, this green, the green So uh, we, we will crop? come in after it's planted and burn it off with a herbicide. Um, either something like Roundup or uh, we have used Paraquat mm -hmm. in the past. That burns it off quicker. Um, but, yeah, you, we did try this year. We left a section without spraying it because all that stuff does winter kill and the rye doesn't, and that looks okay. So if your fields are pretty weed-free, I feel like you could plant into that and uh, leave it without spraying it. And... Most of the crop, a lot of it does die from the drill, just from being run over and cut up. But some of the stuff bounces back. And it's, uh, yeah, so that in the, in the plant, it, it probably doesn't look good at all. Like when the first emergen comes up, I know for ours, no, it doesn't, it looks awful, but you just ugly. wait and you wait and eventually everything, like you said, it dies out. And that almost makes, like you said, almost like a mat around the plant, doesn't yeah. it? The corn. No, ever since we started planting green, is what they call it, planting into these cover crops, I've always told my dad after he plants stuff, I said, just walk away for three weeks, don't look at it, and then come back and it'll look great. Because especially when you're planting corn into something that's two or four feet tall, and you can't see it for the first three months of its life, Yeah. but then you roll in with a combine and you're pulling off 200 bushel corn, it makes you a believer. Yeah, the, the, like you said, the neighbors or the people drive by say, what the hell are they doing? Yeah. But it works. It, it, no, that's it, exactly what a bunch of people said that about this field. They were like, what are you doing where those peas were? I said, well, I planted a cover crop, and then I planted a real crop into it. And they just couldn't believe it. So would this have been in the bio strip till? No. this. So next year, after the rye crop gets harvested, that'll be into bio strip till. Um. We can cycle through some more of the yeah. pictures if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that is a bio strip till cover crop field at full growth towards the end of summer before it's been frosted off. I like to throw in about five pounds of sunflower seeds because everybody loves them if they make it to bloom. 
Um, this year, they were just starting to bloom when they got froze off, so it didn't look quite as nice as that. And that was the best I ever had it get, and it was very popular with the neighbors. Trying to see kind of there. Is yeah, the you rose, can the rows of sunflowers. You can almost see, can't you? Yeah, you can almost see the the sunflowers in That's, there. Yeah, right. Huh. So this was planting rye into snow. I think that was towards the end of December last year. And that cover crop was one of the most even ones we had this spring as far as emergence and growth. Everybody thought we were nuts planting in the snow, but it was like, if the drill's not plugging up, let's keep going. Was that, was the ground frozen at all? Or it just had a layer it, of snow on it? It had a layer of snow and just enough of a crust that it wasn't muddy. Okay. That's, yeah, that was one thing I was wondering if you were ripping the, marking nope, the it, soil up. It got just cold enough after he got that 40 acres done, started going around the, the next 45 acre field and the row unit started to freeze. The actual dirt in between the blades was freezing to the blades, making them stop, stop turning. <laughs> so that's when we had to call it quits. Get out the torch, start heating yeah, them up. Yeah. Things you never, you don't think you'd have an issue with that on a grain drill, the blades freezing, but. And probably last year was kind of an, I don't know if it was an anomaly, but it was such a late year. Yeah, the the prior two years in the fall have been so wet and so late that it's just been a, that was a real challenge. That's when we started realizing, okay, if it's too wet to drill, we're going to load the airflow up and just go blow it on top. Hmm. And this year was the opposite. It was, you were probably done combining in yeah, October? Yeah, we were, we were done by uh, done by Thanksgiving. Okay, yeah. And we had everything cover cropped, I think, the day after we got done combining, he had everything planted. Not bad. So that is this year's biostrip till crop. Um, actually, that was just a few days ago. So that's what it currently looks like. You can see the tall rows are actually the the non overwintering rows. That's the oats that you see there. Okay. And in between will be clover and vetch, and purple top turnips, um, kale, uh, impact forage collard. That's a new one I'm trying. Rye. Some I don't know if I threw wheat in this year, but sometimes I just clean the barn out of whatever kind of seed I have laying around and throw it in. It's a good way to get yeah, rid of it. Yeah, it's a good way to get rid of it. No, but that I think there was a total of 21 species in that mix this year, and it turned out great. So do you know when, it, when about this would have been planted? I think I planted that right around August 1st. Okay. So that's the one benefit, at least you can, compared to dairies, you can get, some yeah. of these cover crops in earlier. No, that's uh, that's what I like about small grains is you get a great window for cover cropping afterwards. Um, corn silage, you do still have more more options than just rye. Um, I planted some uh, rapeseed and Austrian winter peas for a farm this year mixed with triticale. I'm looking forward to seeing how that turns out this year. But um, I actually do some cover crop seed mixing as well. I sell cover crop seed and... My biggest customer is uh, uh, Mulligan Farms, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. And he he gets a pretty diverse mix every year, and he chases the chases the chopper with a with the drill, and that turns out great every year. Yeah. Huh. So what I I maybe I misheard you. Did you say what crop this will be next year? That field there will be grain corn next year. Okay. Yeah. So you have to, the one thing with cover crops and we found out, I'm, you know, better than I do, you really have to plan. Yes. Like you, 18 you to, months ahead. You have to plan for the next year on top of this year. Yeah. It really makes you have to plan ahead and forward think. But, um, a couple of years ago I didn't plan ahead. And after sweet corn, I put in rapeseed and a type of clover and some other species with, rye as a cover crop and that next year we planted soybeans well the herbicide didn't kill off all of the rapeseed it was kind of hardy against the glyphosate and the other products we used and it was getting towards the fall and my dad went and looked and he said do you think we should spray this and I said oh I don't think so because the stuff was only about four inches tall and uh, I figured I'd be able to get in there with a combine and it might run some green leaves through but it'd be fine well about two weeks after we decided not to spray most of it, the stuff bolted, which means it shoots a big stalk out and the flowers. Oh. And it got 
about a foot taller than the soybeans were. And these were uh, 80 bushel beans that I managed to get 63 bushel off of the 13 acre field. And I got 35 bushel per acre off of the 25 acre field. So we were able to scrape up enough to, to break even, but that was a, I'd say that was a cover crop failure. Beautiful beans that I, if I had decided to spray that stuff off, they would have been fine, but you live and you learn. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Which is why I actually did a bio strip till field for soybeans next year. And I knew not to include stuff like rapeseed and turnips that might be harder to kill with soybean herbicides. Cause we plan all non GMO now. Okay. Yeah. 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 We'll have to get into the non GMO. Yeah. We'll get into that later and talk about your cover crop uh, business you have there. I don't think he's got any more. Oh. Well, I guess that was the last one. Oh, that's planting into the bio strip till up there. Most of those right first here? pictures. Oh, this one right here. Yeah, a bunch of those are strip tilling into it. <clears throat> so in this picture, that's our uh, Great Plains Nutra Pro, which is our, I would say, less invasive strip till unit it's just got three straight coulters that drop fertilizer behind them um, it fluffs the ground a little bit and i try to use that on the ground where it's very rocky and normally you wouldn't even be able to strip till it because it'd pull up too many rocks or you'd break the equipment um, just to help put some more of the nutrients down this way instead of having it all have to go down with the planter and that worked quite well. This is into the bio strip till. You can see the dead area in between the green rows of cover crop. And it lines up perfect with our planters. Yeah, that's all by design with GPS and all that. So yes. you can, yeah. Yeah, we have a 40 foot drill and 40 foot planters and 40 foot strip tillers and a 40 foot grain head on the combine and a eight row corn head. So it all lines up just right. You can't you can't keep that centered the whole time, Chad. Just yourself. <laughs> well, dur during corn, I do actually steer by myself because that's one of my the few things that I won't use auto steer in is combining corn because I like to steer steer it myself manually. That's probably the most fun thing in my mind on the farm. Combining corn. Combining corn. Yeah. Well, when it's when it's standing, if it goes down, then I'd like to let somebody else do it, but they won't <laughs> let me get out of the seat. They say, oh, no, if you're running it in good conditions, you can run it in that. <laughs> the, um, do you have the GPS you have to turn around at the end of the field? Yeah. Yeah, okay. with our GPS, we still do have to turn around manually at the end of the field, which isn't the end of the world because if the computer messed up and didn't turn just right and hooked the wing of the planter on a tree, you'd feel pretty bad about that. Yeah, yeah. And it keeps you awake. I mean, yeah, it's it keeps easy you to... awake, paying attention. Especially the some of the field sizes you have, they got to be pretty long, aren't they? Yeah, when you're going across there with a planter at two miles an hour and the field's half a mile long, it takes 15 minutes to get from one end to the other. You can fall asleep after lunch pretty easily. <laughs> got to slap yourself awake. Yeah. No, you got to turn on the the butt or the alarm that goes off before you get to the end of the field. Make oh. sure you're awake. Does your is that yeah, it, you, it beeps at us? Oh, really? Before you get to the end of the field. See, our fields aren't that big, so we're we're turning around, going down, and then before you know, it, we have to turn back around. Yeah. Around here, we don't have those nice long fields. Like no, you we're guys we're got. pretty fortunate with our yeah. field size. Yeah. Like you said, driving over, it's up and down and over and around, and yeah, God bless you guys who work these hills. <laughs> Luckily, we don't we don't work a lot of hills compared to some people around here. So yeah, it's, yeah. That's the that's our rig, uh, the whole picture of it. You can see the. The tires of the tractor actually drive on the green rows so that they go in between where the corn will be, and then the units behind it line up right in the center of those green rows. Why don't you want to drive on the dead rows where the corn's going to go? Because that would uh, compact the soil down and uh, make it harder for the, the corn plants to get out of the ground and emerge evenly. Yeah. Controlled traffic, they call it, is trying to keep all your wheel tracks in the same track. Yeah. Like I said, there's a lot of uh, a lot of planning and measuring. Yeah, it's yeah. It adds and it adds quite a few variables to the whole operation once you start throwing cover crops in the mix. Yeah, that's our Krauss Gladiator 
which is the one, the, our strip tiller with the shank on it. And that is actually in a field right behind my house. The same mix as the prior field, but this one was drag lined with about 12,000 gallons of manure over the winter. And as you can see, the grasses and the purple top turnips just exploded. They took all that nitrogen, soaked it right up, and held on to it. And I had it so the strip till bar lined up just perfect in between those rows, so it's not even knocking them over. And when he came in with a planter, it lined right up in between, and it planted beautifully. Um, you're saying manure? Do you get? You have access to much manure? Um, there's a few blocks we have where we can get it drag lined because it's close enough. Um, we could have it have it tanked in, and spread with a tractor and tank spreader, but we're very picky about when we can have that done. Ideally, I'd like it to be froze up mm -hmm. so that you're not leaving marks or dry enough so you're not leaving marks and compacting the loading area. Um, but most of the time in New York, you're not fortunate to have fortunate enough to be able to spread on days like that. Yeah. So once in a while, we'll get some manure, but it's not very often. Is it, would you, if you had your way, would you have manure on all your crops? Um, if you could unseparated manure, yes. Separated manure, I feel like if you put it on in the wintertime, I wouldn't call it a waste of money, but you lose almost all that nitrogen, which is, for me, what you need to be utilizing on top of the P and the K to make the manure pay for itself because I don't have to get rid of it. I don't have to spread it, so I'm pretty much buying it in. So to make it pencil out on my end, I need to be able to use that nitrogen in the crop the following year, which putting it onto these cover crops like that, I was able to do. So separated. So that's where you're talking about uh, solids are taken yes. out and it's just the fluid effluent. Yes. Okay. So that was separated manure that was pumped on. And because it was injected in the ground into a cover crop, I would say we were able to retain probably 80% of the nitrogen. And it translocated into the corn crop. Um, that was actually one of our best fields. Corn looked great all year, other than it got very dry this year during mm -hmm. periods of time. Um, I, I think that was our second best field. But it dry, there's a spot in that field that dries out very easily because there's only about 30 inches between you and the bedrock. Oh, it's shallow soil. Very shallow very soil. Shallow. Wow. Yeah, and wow. It's still, I think that field averaged 195 <clears throat> dry bushel per acre. Not bad. No, I was I was pretty happy. <laughs> yeah, so like you said, it's in in uh, the way you do it. A dairy just gets rid of the manure because, like we do, we got we have it every day. We got it, put it somewhere where you're buying it, and you want to try to offset your input costs of fertilizer. Yeah, for that coming year. Yep, and which, retain that. If you nitrogen. do it right, you can you can do that very easily. But you have to have to put it on right timing and put it in on the right way. I mean, if we went out this time of year and just top spread um, separated liquid manure on all that nitrogen would be gone by the spring. Yes. Your phosphorus and your potassium would be there, which is worth quite a bit, but I don't know if that would pay for the cost of spreading for us. I was going to ask you, um, just, I had a question for you and it just disappeared. Um, anyway, it'll come to you. Yeah. It'll come back. But, um, yeah. Huh. Move on. So that was this spring. Um, we've figured out over the years that if the cover crop gets too tall or too lush, like this had a lot of hairy vetch that grew very well. And hairy vetch does not grow straight up in nice rows like you would want it to because, believe it or not, this field is the same exact mix as the last picture. As this picture? That is the same mix of cover crop seeds. The only difference is the manure on that made the the grasses and the brassicas grow very well, which grow straight up. And the next picture, it made the this was not applied with the manure, so the the clovers and the vetches grew very well. And the vetch grows between the rows, and it's a very viney crop. Fortunately, it cuts very easily, but it also wraps on colders very easily. 
So I tried strip tilling this field without rolling it ahead of time. I did maybe five acres out of this 25 acre field. And that's when I called my brother-in-law and asked him to bring the roller up. So we started rolling in front of the, the strip tiller and it lays everything down flat and lets the, lets the row units cut through without wrapping up and plugging. And yes, the, for, the roller is also 40 feet wide. <laughs> See, uh, there's kind of, uh, uh, everything's on the same size. Yeah. It makes it easier. Yeah. And we just, uh, just upgraded the sprayer to 120 foot boom. So that'll be driving in the same tracks as four, everything yeah. else. Everything's on four. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing that's not is our airflow, but that's on 60 foot That's 60 foot wide. So that works out with a 16 row planner. You just need to bump everything up to 60 foot then. Yeah. <laughs> so, Someday. It must be a, a heck of a time going down the road with those. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. It's bad enough with a drill or that tractor with the triples on it. Yeah. You get some nice sign language from driver by, people driving by. Occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> so I was. I remember the question I was going to ask. Applying manure, especially knife feed in them or injecting, do you find that disturbs the cover crops? Or do they apply it in a certain, do you have them apply it in a certain way so it doesn't um, affect it? It did disturb it some. But you would be surprised to see how much comes back even after they knife it through. I mean, where they didn't leave marks with the tractor, you almost couldn't tell that they had been in there injecting the manure. It it came back, and even where it was lifted out of the ground where the knife went through, even that's, most of that stuff grew back. Hmm. The problem is where the tractor leaves ruts or where the tractor spins it'll kill more of the cover crop than the actual injecting tool will. Okay. that That's always been our thing because as we, we're moving closer and closer to doing drag line right now, it's all surface supplied on our farm. And I've always wondered how is that going to impact our cover crops? Is it going to just, you know, because we like to take some off, like I said, in the well, spring. Well, if, if you plan on chopping it, I would go go through with the rock picker or the, the color packer afterwards to make sure you get all the rocks pushed down before you mow it. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we, we do that. I fall and in the spring... No, but I, I've all often wondered if uh, you went out with a spreader and spread the cover crop on and then drag lined or injected the manure, what, what that soil disturbance would do for getting the cover crop started. Oh, I see. If that would be a viable way to, if you were in a, in a hurry, go out and run the airflow with rye ahead of time and then go through with the, the and, manure injector. And let that turn up the soil. Yeah. I never thought about that. It'd be something to try. Yeah, that is a. I ne- I never thought about that. All sorts of yeah. different ways to do it. No, and some guys with tank spreaders dump a bag of seed in the the tank before they go spread it, and that's how they put their cover crops on. I wouldn't like having to climb up on top of the tanker <laughs> with every load, but. But we've we just have a little. We have a tanker, and then we have just like a side shooter spreader, and typically in the fall, if we have any cover crops like if we took rye off we combined ourselves and we had a stockpiled in a commodity bay and then we use that rye seed as a cover crop sometimes we'll have like a bucket worth left over and we just dump it in the spreader and you spread it on and next spring you can tell where it is because it's the thickest and tall it yeah basically been inoculated and manure into the ground and it's just like supercharged oh So this was that same field where the roller was when I was strip tilling it after it had been rolled. You can see how flat that the cover crop is. And actually the vetch kind of, that lays down the nicest when you roll it and it'll hold everything else down as well. And you can see the strip till is leaving right behind you. It's, it's just disturbing, just a slot. Yep. And if you look in front of the actual toolbar, you can kind of see the rows of the the cover crop that was that's what it was intended to be the bare spot right there right there yeah and then that's where you you rolled it down yep wow that roller does a really nice job yeah all it has to do is i mean it's not a roller crimper so you couldn't roll it and then not have to spray it because that cover crop will bounce back so this will stand back up after about well it'll stand back up at like 50 percent rate probably a week later we planted this about four days later and it wasn't any issue with stuff standing back up and wrapping 
but and like you said, sometimes you can roll it and crimp it at the same time. That actually that'll kill it, right? It's basically snapping the stock in yes. half. Yeah, but the downside to that is you have to wait till it's mostly done with rye um, and some vetch, but you have to wait till the stuff is bigger, which often means waiting later to plant. Um, oh yeah. And as far as yields go, it seems like the earlier you get stuff in, the better it will yield. We actually had a planter breakdown this spring. Our planting tractor is a 1975 John Deere 8430 with almost all the precision upgrades you could want for the planter on it. So it's kind of backwards that we're using a, a yeah, antique of a tractor to pull a modern day planter. But I think that really tickles my dad's fancy doing that, <laughs> bragging about how cheap a tractor he's got on there until it blows an axle bearing out and we can't get it fixed for a, a week so we had a, a week delay in planting and i think that hurt us some because the the weather turned very dry all of a sudden so that week of weather when you could have had stuff planted and growing and instead it didn't rain for that seven days and it got even drier our yields were down a little bit from where i would have liked to see them but now we know going forward yeah well, hopefully that's one of those breakdowns that doesn't typically happen. No. No, and we decided to pull it in the shop this winter and make sure all the axle bearings are yeah. good. Yeah. Figure out if something's bad in January and you yes. can wait you can wait two months if you got to. Yeah. Yeah. When it gets to be May, that's the last thing you want to do is no, wait. When it's when it's May and you drop it off at the dealership and say, I don't care how you get it done, but I want everything you can next day air everything. Yeah. I said, I just want it done as fast as possible. It's no fun <laughs> sitting there looking at a tractor when you could be out planting corn. Yeah. So you, you didn't really have anything else. It didn't have all the GPS. No, it would it would take so long to switch everything over to run all the components on the planner. I mean, everything we put on the planner, we've done plots with and research on to make sure that it pays. So yes, you could go out and plant with a different one, but we put all this money into the planner to do a specific job of planting corn the best way possible. So do you do a subpar job planting or do you wait for your own planter to run? And looking back now, maybe it would have been better to get a different planter to put some corn in with, but the year turned out okay. Do you think if it didn't turn so dry, it would have been maybe a little more forgiving and you wouldn't have seen that? Yes, because drop off. I mean, after the corn got put in the ground, it got so dry that our corn pretty much didn't get above knee high until the end of July. Most of it. I mean, I was outside dressing with our airflow, and almost all of the fields were rolled up like they looked like pineapples growing out there. Just yeah, curled right up, trying to conserve yes moisture, reduce surface area. But then it, it rained shortly after that, and actually all of our corn, I would say, was at least 9 to 10 feet tall. There were spots it was it was quite tall, even after being so short for so long. And we averaged 185 bushel per acre dry, um, which means that's the number of bushels you get paid for. When you say wet, it could be a, any moisture. Yeah. Um, but we convert everything to dry, dry yield. Yeah, it's more. I mean, yeah, like you said, it could be soaking that's what, wet. That's what you yeah. get paid that's for. What, yeah, it's really what matters. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the, the slot of that same field after it had been rolled and strip-tilled. And that's what we would plant onto. Yeah, you plant right into that little slot there. Yep. And what are these? How, how wide are these rows? Those are 30-inch rows. And what's the, you know, you, you'll hear 30-inch, 15-inch twin I, I think, rows. Well, we plant twin rows, which means there will be a row of corn on each side of that slot, seven and a half inches apart, but they're on 30-inch centers. So on each one of those strips, there will be two rows of corn. And you can u still use your standard 30-inch corn head, 30-inch um, strip till bar, um, there's some guys that plant 20 inch and they have to buy a whole new corn head, all new strip tiller. That's why we elected to go with twin row. Um, but after this year, planning onto strips like that, 
we decided we might try planning some single row next year to see if it's better to do single row on the strips like that. Um, if it's a nice, nice wide strip of dirt, which would be about eight inches wide at most, it'll, it'll plant well into that and give you a good emergence, but got to be ready to adapt to single rows or something different if the conditions change. Yeah. And then like population wise, you shoot them for the 30, 30, 35 so actually, thousand. We plan almost a hundred percent variable rate population starting this year. I take previous year yield maps and in the poorer areas, I cut back to depending on the field and myself knowing what it can average on a good year. It'll be anywhere. The low areas will be 28 to 32,000. And then the top end, I usually have five ranges that I plant. Um, the top end will usually be 40 to 42,000 seeds per acre. So depending on the, the years of the past, um, the corn yield, I usually try to take a good average yield map to use instead of a particularly dry year, particularly wet year. I try to pick one that's average um, and base my planting maps off of that. And I do all that myself in house, and it seems to be working quite well. Huh? And I just started doing that with soybeans this year, which is actually opposite. In the good areas, you can back the population down, and in the poor areas, you have to plant more, because each plant will only produce so many beans in the poor areas. So the more plants you have, the more it'll produce overall. Okay. And then, so you variable rate, so that, are you able to basically plug that field into the GPS and tell it in certain parts, I want this rate, and on the fly, the computer's yep. telling it to switch. Yeah, yeah. I, make, I make the maps on my computer. I put them on a thumb drive. I plug it into the monitor. And then when you move to that field, you select that prescription map, um, upload it into the monitor, and it does it all on its own based on GPS coordinates. It's pretty amazing. You can you can look back and watch the planter shaft spinning, and it'll be going slow, and then all of a sudden it'll be going real fast, and then it'll slow back down a little bit. And it's, I think it's pretty cool. Do you think if you took that yield map and you were to overlay a soils map over it, you would see a uh, like where the lines were different soils change throughout the field? It's pretty similar. Yes. Um, excuse me. Yes, but. Oftentimes, moisture will play a bigger role in it. Like, you can have a soils change, but if the field's not tiled properly and it gets and it's just wet, the whole area down there, it'll both spots will be poor, even though they're different soil types. Um, up where it's adequately drained and it's not a particularly dry area, yeah, that's I think that does play into your yield maps quite a bit. Tree lines and water, and I mean, even doing soybeans, woodchuck holes out in the middle of the field. You'll have a, a big red spot in the middle of the field, about an acre wide. And it's like, what is that bad spot in the middle of the field? And then it's like, oh, yeah, there's a woodchuck hole out there that ate all the soybeans off. So you gotta, I mean, you can have your maps analyzed by somebody who doesn't know the fields, but it helps when you do it yourself and you know, okay, that spot was due to an anomaly of some kind yeah yeah there's this stuff stupid woodchuck yeah huh. that's i didn't realize you were doing the whole variable rate yep we actually started grid sampling our fields on one acre grids this past year so i just got done applying our potash on uh, one acre variable rate grids um we're doing our we actually bought a lime spreader to do our own lime now we're going whole hog with this variable rate stuff. Yeah, wow. And I hope sometime in the future we, we, uh, we're on the get granular program this spring as a trial, which gives you satellite imagery of your your crops in season. Um, I'm hoping someday we'll be able to take those satellite images and make variable rate side dress nitrogen maps for the corn based on a satellite picture of the field that's only a couple days old make a map in the computer, plug it into the monitor, and go out and put the right amount of nitrogen where it's needed. And this is all just, I mean, it's it saves you money. It's better for the soil. It's better for yep. the plant, better for the environment. It's, 
there's a lot of things farmers do to yeah improve and yeah i mean our our new sprayer we're buying that with individual nozzle shut off so as each nozzle overlaps where you've already sprayed it'll shut itself off um our corn planter the starter fertilizer is applied directly underneath each seed and it's one squirt it's not a solid stream so we cut our fertilizer rate on corn our pop-up from 10 gallons down to two and a half gallons which is that's a pretty substantial savings, three quarters of a savings, and I did not see a yield drag. Wow. It's amazing that it, it puts a squirt of fertilizer under each seed, so it doesn't put any fertilizer out unless it senses a seed. Wow. Yeah. It's, technology is unreal. Yeah. The technology. And I'm sure you, you think, I guess looking 10 years down the road, where do you think it'll be it's it's, it's going to continue do you think there's anything it's we've you've hit all the big rocks and now it's just kind of in terms of rocks i mean like you know the gps is a big thing that we have yeah. now and it's just now little pebbles that we start picking at to improve that you think i yeah I, I feel that's an accurate description i mean the auto steer that was that was huge i mean if you asked me when i started driving tractor back when i was eight or ten years old if someday it would steer itself, I would have been like, no way. And then before I was even out of high school, we had a tractor with full auto steer in it, steering itself. And I was just blown away. And now the, the things we can do today with controlling everything, and it's unbelievable. Yeah. So that was no tilling soybeans into rye that was planted after we uh, we actually chopped that field off for earlage, which is when you use a combine corn head on the chopper and just take the ears and blow them into the truck. So that was, we were able to plant that a little bit earlier than after grain corn. And I would say that stuff is about five feet tall. I think I've got another picture in there of the tractor. Yep, right there. Oh, wow. So that tractor has a 38-inch tires on it, and it's a articulating tractor. And you, as you can see, the rye is almost up to the top of the tires. And those soybeans were the, that was the last field I planted, and they they still averaged almost as good as the rest of them. So the rye definitely didn't hold the hold the beans back at all. Do you ever uh, worry about the whole C to N ratio and planting into green and the whole delay of nitrogen being released? Um. It does cross my mind, but with soybeans, I've actually found it helps to make the beans more hardy. And soybeans make their own nitrogen. So if you give them nitrogen up front, it makes them lazy because they've already got the nitrogen. They don't have to work. If you don't give it to them, they put on nodules, which make the nitrogen. Mm. Um, and they actually work harder and make more of their own nitrogen. So the rye, having taken most of the the soil nitrogen out of the field makes the beans work harder for it, which I think makes the beans actually yield a little bit better. Corn, on the other hand, as long as you adequately put enough pop-up fertilizer and initial nitrogen down, um, I don't see a yield drag because it will eventually break down in season and release that nitrogen back. But that's when pop-up fertilizer and starter nitrogen are crucial yeah so the whole i c to n carbon to nitrogen ratios basically you take like a tall like chad said a tall a rye green crop once you knock it down or plow it under or kill it off it doesn't just automatically break down and release within a day it, it takes time for that plant to break down and release the nitrogen and so that's kind of what he was talking about with corn it uh, you want to have nitrogen up front and then the slow release over time of the as the uh, rye breaks down it kind of keeps feeding the corn yep so spoon feeds it over time yeah which is and that's you know and basically that's why you plant cover crops it holds that nitrogen all winter long it doesn't let it leach out it holds in the plant and then come springtime when you when you kill it off it's there to use and yep. yeah it's So that is corn growing this year in the bio strip till fields. As you can see, healthy corn plants in between tall, dead cover crop that had been sprayed off. 
Um, this was actually during the dry period that I was talking about. So that corn could have used a drink of water, but it, it was doing okay. Do you think having the cover crops, and since you aren't plowing it under, it's able, like we were talking earlier, it retains, the, it holds more moisture? Yes, and I I would say especially later in the summer it helps more. That's that's kind of what, because being such a dry year, we wondered if, well, it's so dry, but I wonder if our corn is maybe a little bit better off just because you have the crop is helping keep the, uh, like, you know, you have the tall dying rye there helps keep the sun from just penetrating the surface and evaporating everything. Yep. So this is uh, my pile of cover crop seed before I mix it up in that that blue mixer there. It's got an auger where you dump everything in the bottom and it spins it up top into the hopper and it keeps circulating the seeds to mix it up properly. Um, This was from a couple years back and I just took a picture because it blew me away how many uh, different kinds of seed there were and how big and diverse the quantity was. Um, I can't remember. I think there were somewhere around 18 or 19 species in this one. And um, as you can see, it came in all different shapes and sizes. So what is that? It's like a tote on the left. You got the bags there on a pallet. Then what's the what's what's the tote there? So the tote bag said peanuts only. I think that was some leftover soybeans we had kicking around that I threw in. Um, the tote on the very left was triticale seed, and then those bags in the very front are a bunch of different species like clover and radish that I had mixed up. And then the blue bags behind them are sunflowers that I bought from actually Country Max. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just uh, bird seed sunflowers, and I bought them the first time from Ace Hardware. I said, "Well, will they grow?" And they were like, "Yeah, I think so." So I said, "All right, good enough for me. I'll take a pallet." Yeah, what they say when you said you take a pallet? They were they were pretty blown away that I was taking a whole pallet of bird seed. They were like, "You must have a lot of birds." <laughs> I said, yeah, I got about 300 acres worth of birds to feed. Yeah, 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 they'll come eat it. Uh, <laughs> um, so are these, and some of these, you said you do your own cover cropping business. Is this yeah. some of your own product that you source? Or Yeah, um, we can either, we either buy stuff through Seedway or I buy stuff through Bird Agronomics out in Ohio, depending on the price and quantity I need. Um, and I'm a dealer for both of them, I guess. And I sell to various farms. I'll get calls from all sorts of random people for different cover crop needs. We grow our own our own rye in house and sell that for for cover crop seed, and that's been quite a quite a good business front for us. As opposed to growing wheat, um, the price is usually better. You get more straw that we sell off to dairies, and uh, all in all, the yield is not much lower. I mean, when we first started growing rye, people were like, oh, you'll get 40, 45 bushel. But we started pushing it, and last year we averaged 99 bushel per acre. And this year, I believe we averaged somewhere around 85. It took a beating from that dry weather Mm -hmm. right when it was flowering and making the grain, but it turned out good still. Yeah, and like you said, with more and more dairies, especially doing cover crops, the, the demand for, you know, just going to you and say, hey, yeah. I want a couple ton of rye seed and you can, it's, you know, it's, it's a good market for you. Yeah. I mean, when we, after we got done harvesting the rye, I think I had somewhere around 35,000 bushel and, um, we actually grew some for certified seed for Seedway, and the rest of it, it was like, how am I ever going to sell all of this? And then by the end of the fall, I was getting phone calls from people wanting rye and I was like, I'm sorry, I'm all out. I don't have any more to sell. <laughs> it's just amazing what the cover crop business business is doing yeah no it's and getting good quality seed too yeah we uh we send everything out to be germination and purity tested that we grow so that when somebody buys it from us they know it's going to grow it's going to be weed free and i pride myself on running a red combine 
and I run it myself and I do a very good job cleaning the seed. So unless you run an air drill, I don't have to clean it before you put it in your drill. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was just a, a picture I took that I thought was neat. That's our, our main combine in the middle. That's a 40 foot head, yes. small grain head. Yeah, that's our uh, Case IH 8120 and that is on tracks because the compaction issues that you see from combines can be quite bad and the tracks I almost never leave a mark in the field and I I own a couple collector combines and I had them out that day and was running them both and just thought they looked pretty neat in comparison to that one in the middle you can do about one pass would be of what four of those yeah that one on the left is a international 303 and I'm actually the second owner of that one and that's got a 10 foot head then the one on the right is a 1963 case 600 with a 13 foot head that's a, a big time machine for back then and they still you still work yeah they still work i <laughs> that's one of my hobbies no gps in those no nope, no you gotta steer those by hand <laughs> no eight or does it have does it have just a blower air just blows air at you the, that cab does it does not have air conditioning but it's got two massive fans that yeah. move a lot of air yeah and even on a 90 degree day I've run that when it was 90 out, and those two fans keep you cool enough to keep the door closed. Yeah. That other one does not have a cab, and you eat every ounce of dust. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. I think we're back. Yeah, we started with this one, right? Yep. So, cool. Um, I guess. Is there anything else you want to talk about picture-wise? or? No. Did we cover all the pictures? I think we've done that. That one. Yeah, I think we've got yeah, them all. Yeah, got them all. So. And we're back. So you were talking about planting non-GMO. What, um, I guess for people who might not know what that is or why you know, why do you do it, I guess, why don't you elaborate on that okay. some? We, uh, we started back in 2016 when a, a neighboring dairy farmer was looking for somebody to grow some non-GMO corn and non-GMO beans, which when I say non-GMO, it means it does not have any transgenic traits. Um, it does not have herbicide resistance or um, insect resistance built into the genes of the plant. So if we spray our corn or beans with Roundup, it will kill it versus if you buy Roundup Ready corn or Roundup Ready soybeans, it will not. Um, the seed is significantly cheaper because it doesn't have those traits in it, which those traits come with research costs and all sorts of stuff like that, which is understandable because they have to develop the traits in the first place. Um, but with our diverse crop rotation, we don't have to worry about insect pressure and the weed pressure isn't as bad from the cover crops and the crop rotation. So we can get away with not needing in-season Roundup sprays and the not having the BT genes in the corn. Um, so we we were approached by that farmer back in 2016, and I told Dad, I was like, maybe we should look into this. So we called around, and there's a, there's a premium for non-GMO beans. And uh, the corn, I looked at the price of corn per bag, and this was before we'd ordered anything, and we had gotten a quote from our Pioneer dealer, and it was over $300 a bag, for 16 or 32 bags of their corn and the stuff that i bought from companies that i'd never heard of was anywhere from 150 to 165 dollars a bag and i did i decided on the the corn through the michigan state research plots that year and that worked out pretty well the corn actually averaged better than our gmo corn did um we've and after 2016, we switched over 100% so that we didn't have to keep track in the bins what was GMO, what wasn't. I would say the soybeans have been the best since uh, you save on the seed, and then there is a premium for the actual beans themselves. We will get anywhere from $0.80 cents to a dollar over Chicago Board of Trade price, and most times the local mills are about $0.80 cents under the Chicago board. So we're making a dollar fifty to two dollars over what they're making. But it does include some more 
some more intelligent herbicide choices. Mm -hmm. You can't just go out and blindly spray with Roundup. We have to actively scout our fields, and it involves a lot more a lot more scouting in the end. Yeah, I guess the benefits and the um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, but what's good? You know, what do you think's good about it? And then what might be something that's not so good? Or is there what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> uh, not cost benefit, but you know, you have your you know the pros and cons. That's that's the word I'm looking for of GMO versus non-GMO. So I would say the the end product overall, I don't think. There's any lick of difference between GMO and non-GMO as far as safeness and quality of product. Um, people think that if it's a non-GMO corn, it'll be full of bugs. That's not true. Um, our corn looks as good as the GMO stuff getting brought into the same mill. Um, the GMO stuff, it can be easier to control persistent and tough weeds. The non-GMO stuff, you have to use older chemistries of some more um, dangerous herbicides. So that's why you don't just go out and spray if you see a few weeds. You wait until there's an economic threshold or uh, you actively scout to see what you can use that's the, the least harmful. Um, that's why I said it, it takes a lot more scouting for the non-GMO stuff. Um, i say the biggest benefit for us was the economics of the added profit from the better cost, the better income on the soybeans on top of the, the reduced seed cost. And for corn, our herbicide program actually has not changed much, if any. Um, and the seed cost is almost, I wouldn't say half, but it saved us at least $50 an acre, which adds up pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, times 1600 Yeah. <laughs> So, but like you said, you kind of have the benefit of you aren't just corn, soy, corn, soy. You're corn, hay. You do cover crops. You're yep. so you're the bugs aren't just getting used to one thing, one thing after that's, another. And yeah, that's a a big advantage we have over other farms in the areas. We have a lot of rotation, so it gives us an edge up on being able to plant that non-GMO stuff. Yeah. No, I think GMOs are great. Like you said, there's no difference of the end product. It's exactly the same i just think that uh sometimes gmos can be people use it as a silver bullet yes and it shouldn't be it should be used as a tool and not a silver bullet i've seen too many farms um grow soybeans and only spray roundup and then that's when we get roundup ready mare's tail on our fields because it blew in from other farms fields in the area and just because it's Roundup ready doesn't mean you only have to spray Roundup. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's so easy, you yes, know? It's I so easy. That, that describes it exactly. It's it's, it's, it's easy too, and it's cheap. Yeah. You just go out there. Oh, it's Roundup ready. Hit it with Roundup and it's one pass. You're done. Yep. And, but uh, it's, yeah, as long as, like you said, you, you don't hit the non-GMO with Roundup. Then yeah. You'll be no, I, I remember <laughs> back when dad started planting Roundup ready corn. I think that was back in the late nineties. He was a little late to the game. It came out and came out in ninety six, I if I remember right. The Yeah, ninety six. Uh, I think he started planting at about ninety nine or two thousand. And he was still planting some non roundup ready corn at the time and he sprayed a field of non roundup ready with Roundup and got to replant that field. Yeah. We've all done it. That's when he learned really quick, I'm going to switch everything or nothing. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, once you have that one random field that is non roundup, and then yeah. you just yeah, just go out and spray it all, and then oh, crap. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh. So I guess a uh, little change gears a little bit. If you weren't in agriculture, if you weren't didn't grow up on a farm, didn't go to Cornell, or maybe you went, to, maybe you would have gone to Cornell, but if you didn't do anything with agriculture, what do you think? you would be doing right now i think i would be a heavy equipment operator for construction that is one of the things i purely enjoy we have our own excavator on the farm and um actually when my the barns at my house burned down this past winter we rented some heavy equipment to take care of the rubble and 
that is something I really enjoy and I feel like I've got some good skill set at is running heavy equipment like an excavator or a bulldozer. Um, I like running mini excavators and backhoes. It's just doing grading work or tiling and getting the right grade. It It's something I enjoy and I feel I've got some skill at. It's a, it's a very satisfying when yes. you do a job and it's nice and yeah. We have a guy who works for us, and he's he's he has a good eye for the grading. He's and he's like, yeah, I think he takes a lot of pride in being able to look how nice and flat that yep. is. I just did it with my eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's fun taking a dozer and destroying stuff. Oh yeah, you can't. Yeah, nothing more manly than going out with a dozer and excavator and start ripping crap up. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> we have a it's a forty ton JCB excavator, and man, that'll push over trees that are three foot in diameter. And it's like you're sitting there, and it's like you're pushing over a toothpick. Yeah. Then you pick it up and you drop it in the dump trailer and the whole thing shakes when it's behind a 350 horse tractor. It's like, Oh, that must be pretty big. (laughs) So, um, and then I guess what, uh, what else do you like to do besides farming when you're, I know you said you're a husband, father of three. Yep. I, uh, I have three kids at home. So when I'm not working, I prefer to be home with them. Um, and if I get my fill of them somehow, I like to play golf, which I don't get to do as often as I'd like. Um, I've got a four-wheeler and a side-by-side around. I ride around on with the kids. I, li- I like doing that. Um, and actually, I bought a 1969 Corvette from one of our landowners that sat in a barn since 1988 was the last, no, 82 was the last registration on it. And it sat on this dirt floor barn, and I've seen it my whole life growing up. And I finally convinced him to let me buy it this year. So I'm in the process of restoring it. Um, I wouldn't call it a full restoration job just yet. I'm, I haven't taken it off the frame. Uh, I'd like to get it running before I work on the, the looks of the thing. I mean, the interior is in good shape, but especially for sitting for the last 38 years. Uh, but I pulled it out and the motor is stuck so bad I cannot get it to spin over at all. So I've got to pull that out and rebuild it. When I saw you back in September, have you gotten, you were telling me all this, have you gotten any, or, ne- or you probably harvesting started, so yeah. that went to the back of the... Well, I finally got it moved into our shop barn. where all the tools are, so I can start working at it. Um, but no, I, have, I haven't made much progress on it. I got the hood latches fixed, so now if the hood closes, I can open it. Um, got the seats out so I can clean the interior when the time comes, but some one of these days I'll get a few hours and start tearing away at the the engine to get it pulled out of there and get it rebuilt. Well, you said it was you show me pictures is unbelievably clean. Yeah, I for I, for sitting on a dirt unreal. floor, I expected <laughs> um the framework, they call it the bird cage because it's a fiberglass body. They say that can rot out and I expected to find some rot on that from sitting on a dirt floor, but there's nothing. I mean, there was surface rust on the frame, but it'll mm-hmm. it'll polish up very nice when I'm done. So do you plan to try to get that finished this winter that, by spring? That's my hope is to, to get the motor out and figure out where to take it or what to do with it to get it running and get it done right and get it put back in. And then you have you got other toys. You got some motorcycles. and Yeah, I've got three, three motorcycles. I got a dirt bike, a, a Harley, and uh, actually a 67 Yamaha that was – it was my dad's after it was his brother's and it sat in a barn at, over at my grandma's place for years. And then finally I pulled it out of the barn and got it fixed up and running and I pull it out every now and then and ride it around. It's a lot of fun. If it's got a motor, I, I like it. Anything. Yeah. You're, 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 a, you're a big fan of Dodge trucks too. Yeah. We all, if you know, Chad, you know that. Yep. Unfortunately, my, my blue one, that is no more. Yeah, yeah, that was a rough. I don't know if you want to get into that at all, but that was a tough way to tough hear. way to say goodbye. Yeah, yeah. No, that that my uh, like I said, my barns burned down in my house, and I had two old Ford trucks up in the barn, and then my '99 uh, Dodge 2500 that just had a brand new Cummins engine put into it because the the original one the the block cracked on, and all those perished in the fire. Fortunately, there was no actual harm to anybody or any animals or anything so 
I'd say all in all, it could have been a lot worse. A lot of cleanup, but now we have a new barn built there. and Beautiful barn there yeah, you got there. Turned really out nice. turned out great. The kids really enjoy it. They got their bikes out there, got a basketball hoop, a volleyball net. Yeah, well, there's, there's always a, a silver lining, yeah. you know. It's Luckily, like you said, all those things are replaceable. Yep. And no one got hurt. And talking about your kids, what's it like being a dad and being a farmer full time? It's uh, it's tough, but I've got a really great wife who takes most of the load off of me. Um, she pretty much takes care of the kids mostly by herself, and I help when I can, which isn't often enough. Um, but my oldest son Austin, he's super smart. I mean, he's very book smart. He's been reading since um, before he was in kindergarten. He's been reading words and doing sight words and stuff like that. Um, Carter loves to build things with magnets and math. He There's a show on Netflix called Number Blocks where they talk about adding and numbers. And he loves that show, and he's so good at math now because of it. Um, I mean, you can just rattle off addition to him and he'll he'll tell you what it is like say eight plus seven he'll be like 15 and he's four and a half i was gonna say is he even in kindergarten yet no he's in uh he's in preschool now jeez oh no and brianna my daughter she's just two and she's really starting to talk quite a bit now and her vocabulary's taken off quite a bit which is great and she's just uh well she's full of it growing up with two brothers though we're in for it with her they'll toughen her up yeah (laughs) <laughs> uh yeah no it's um like you said it's, it's gotta be tough some days when you're out away from them yeah. all day no, the, every day especially and, when we're doing custom work that's when it it's the most difficult because i can't just stop home for lunch or uh, have savannah bring them out to ride in the tractor with me for a while um but luckily we don't do custom work all the time yeah well, and as they get older, I'm sure they'll be uh, helping hands. Yeah. No, I was uh, I was working in the shop just the other day, and I had Austin with me, and he was grabbing me tools, and he looks at me, he's like, you know, Dad, I'm kind of becoming a farmer like you are. And it was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you kind of are. I got I got a kick out of that. Oh, man. Oh, that's good. You think they're going to – I mean, they're still so young, but do you think they like to ride in tractors, um, and do you think they enjoy it, or – too early they, to tell it's, it's early to tell i'd say they they enjoy it up to a point and mm-hmm. they get bored as especially when the two boys are together oh it's a, like a rough house in there they're always messing around picking on each other but you know how kids are they're busy and they can't do anything besides sit there and watch everything and i let them let them steer when i can and let them do stuff to help but um i hope that one or both of them or all three of the kids will want to come back to the farm but if they don't I'll have an excuse to retire someday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and your dad, he still helps out yeah. bees every day. Oh, yeah. I would say he's a, he's a number one employee on Branton Farms. <laughs> I'm probably number three because I, I try to be at home as much as I can with the kids. My yeah. brother-in-law and my dad probably work more than I do, but I do some behind-the-scenes work, too. Phone yeah. calls in the morning while I'm trying to eat breakfast and get kids ready and working on my computer, doing maps and stuff. But no, my dad, he's, uh, is he 60, 68 now, 67, 68. And he's, uh, he's out there all day, every day. He'll outwork any one of us. And he'll probably do that up until he probably will never really Un- quote unquote retire Yeah, until he can't or until my mom says, okay, you're done. <laughs> no fighting that one is no. there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. When you, you know, I think we'll be the same when you grow up doing it and it's what you know and what you love. You're, it's just natural. I guess my biggest advantage with my dad was he's always been very open to not just hearing my ideas, but trying to get them going. Like if he thinks it's a good enough one, he'll go along with it. Mm -hmm. Like that, uh, that cedar on the drill, that was something I came up with in my sleep and he was like, okay, let's get it ordered and get it done. Yeah, that's yeah. No, that's and the the cover crops. He pretty much gives me free reign with those. Yeah, you kind of have to prove yourself. Yeah, but once that's no, I but found that out as well. But he's once he's always given me a lot of trust since day one, which that's a big, big help in any person coming back to their own family's farm. Yeah, I guess coming back to your own farm. What would you say is a big you know 
do you think people should go out and work someplace else? Or what do you think is, uh, I guess you didn't really talk about, you know, you went to college, Cornell, and then you went straight home to your, to your yeah. farm. No, I, I did an internship with the, the local fertilizer and chemical dealer. And I did that because it was required by school, but they wanted to offer me a full-time job because I was one of the few guys that would just close my mouth and say, okay, when they gave me a nasty job to do or something that nobody liked doing, it was just like, okay, let's get it done. Yeah. Since standing around griping about it. And then uh, actually our friend Tyler Beck, I worked at their farm while we were at school. So I had a little bit of beer money. <laughs> that was, that was good. He, uh, he tried to get me to come back to his farm after school. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> you had enough dairy. Yeah. I, I didn't mind it, <laughs> but those, uh, those five degree days when I spent all day with a, a hand hoe in the barn chipping away at frozen manure, that was enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> or when you go out with a, a load of manure and you pull under the tank, under the spout, you get out to the field and then you turn the spreader on and nothing comes out. Hmm. It, the tank froze. Yeah. I think that was in the shop for two weeks thawing out. Yeah. Frozen manure is the worst. Absolutely. I, I would agree with that worst there's a there's a lot of bad things that happen but when the crap freezes going you know and it's backed up that happened our senior year when i was going back and forth my dad had heart surgery so i was going back and forth to class during the day and working morning and night at the farm and i get a call from chris who works for us he goes so i tried to agitate the manure pit and it actually backed up into the barn and it lifted like the covers that we opened to push the manure into for each pen. Like, Oh, okay. And he's like, I've been working at this for like four hours trying to get, it was basically, it clogged this trench four foot, four foot by four foot trench flows to the end of the barn. And then it goes into a pipe, which takes it out to the a pit. Well, someone, I don't know who, pushed frozen manure into that trench oh. and then that got and it basically built a wall yeah and so we spent i took chris worked at it for basically all day so probably from 11 noon until i got there four or five o'clock and we had just kept dumping water into it had a, like a 10 12 foot pvc pipe pushing it trying to physically push the manure yeah. into the pipe and then finally it broke and it was just like a giant vacuum it just sucked it all in huh. and i was like oh, boy it's like ne- yeah, never I, again <laughs> i commend you dairy farmers working in the winter oh, months man it's, that's yeah. uh that's the one big advantage we have as crop farmers is we don't have to go do stuff outside and go into that nice necessarily a yeah. nice heated garage and well, tear I, stuff apart. I wouldn't say we're always in the nice heated garage. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we ship grain in January and we got to load the trucks for about half an hour. Oh, oh, oh no! <laughs> or we're tearing out fence rows and you got to climb from your pickup into the heated excavator. Oh. Tough day. Yeah. <laughs> and once in a while we have to get out there and get cold for a day, but it's not usually days in a row. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, if you wake up and there's three feet of snow. And it's five degrees out. It's like, well, it could probably wait till tomorrow. Where yes. dairy, it's like, oh, better start shoveling out. The milk truck's gonna be here. Yeah. So. No, no, we don't have to get up and plow snow right away because we got a truck coming in. Yeah. That's, yeah, and then the truck gets stuck, and, oh, and you gotta pull it out. Yeah. No, yeah. always. They always say if so, never go out with the biggest piece of equipment because you always want something bigger to be able to pull it out. With. Uh-huh. <laughs> but. Yeah, so is there anything else you'd like to talk about? or I don't know. Anything you think we ought to talk about? I mean, there's lots we could talk about. Whether it's appropriate to talk about is a totally <laughs> different story. Yeah. But uh, no. So, yeah, for those who don't know, I guess I kind of alluded to it. We were both in AGR, Cornell, you know, met freshman year. Because you – well, this is kind of an interesting – you you originally went to RIT. Yeah, I, I started out as a mechanical engineering student at RIT. And after my uh, first week sitting behind the computer in some of the engineering classes, I called home to my dad and I said, you know, I'd rather be picking rocks than sitting behind this computer for another hour. And he said, then I think you ought to make a few phone calls and change where you're going to school. He said, if that's what really what you want to, what you'd rather be doing, he said, do what makes you happy because... 
You can have all the money in the world, but if you wake up in the morning and you dread going to work, then it's not any kind of life to live. Think you made the right choice? I think so, because there's, I I would say there's never a day I wake up and it's like, oh, I got to go to work. Yeah, there's jobs that aren't very fun, but I make the best of them and I go to work with my dad and my brother-in-law and I enjoy almost every minute of it. Hey, have fun. Yeah. It's a... It's not just an, it's more than a nine to five, but it's not the monotonous, you know, every day can be different in good ways and bad. Yep. And I get to help make all the, all the decisions on the farm and that it feels like I'm, it feels like I'm my own boss. Yeah. I mean, someday I will be, but for now, I guess dad's, dad's the boss. Same, same for me. Yeah. Dad will always be the boss, but he gives you, he gives you a little more rope every year. Right. Yeah. So. But, well, heck, I think I think we covered most everything. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming on, buddy. Oh, I appreciate you having me. It's been this great. This was a blast. Yeah. We'll do this again. Yes, we will. We'll do it again. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all in about a week or so.